Welcome to the Holding All the Cards podcast. My name is Daniel. I go by Kira Mode the Forums. And I just got back from Worlds and I thought I'd talk about something that's uh, very important that was heavily considered when I built my dark side deck and a little bit for my light side deck. And that is the value of cheap wins. Now, I think most people when they build their decks, they're looking strictly at upside. So they're saying if, if I draw, draw well and they draw well, how, how does my deck do? Am I, am I better than that deck or, or am I worse than that deck? But what I don't think enough people look at, take into consideration is how good is your deck at capitalizing on bad draws for your opponents? Now, cheap wins are different for light side and different for dark side. I think a cheap win on dark side is when you can just establish an early board situation with your objectives to a point where if light side just doesn't have the answers in the first couple turns, your board swells up to a point where they can no longer deal with it and uh, they're, they're too far behind to ever get back in the game. On light side, a cheap win is when dark side all they get is like, I don't know, like one guy to defend and that person doesn't have tactics and then light side plays like three different dudes with blast in the first turn and then like add two more guys with blast in the next turn and just overrun them. Though those are cheap wins for each side. So I wanted to make sure that both of my decks can get cheap wins because going into worlds, I knew there would be six or seven rounds of play, which means you're playing somewhere between 12 to 14 matches to get into the top cut. And uh, it, it's hard to win games, you know? So you don't want to lose the gimmies. You want to make sure that when somebody doesn't draw well, you can capitalize on that and make sure you get a win. So on dark side, the best deck at getting a cheap win is um, Navy, right? Because Navy, if you get the the Enforced Loyalty, you get the Tarkin Doctrine, if they can't move around it, then you just deal free damage, and then if you get like two Enforced Loyalty shots off, you're probably going to win. Um, on light side, the easiest one to get cheap wins with is um, Solidarity of Spirit. Like if you get Solidarity of Spirit, they're playing a split deck. Um, you play a guy, they don't play any guys, and you play two more guys on your turn, and they have like shielding, and you just send them in, and they're never catching up. Though those are probably the two easiest ones to get cheap wins with. Um, but there was one deck that came up <clears throat> during my testing that it could get cheap wins. And when it hit, it looked absolutely unstoppable. And when it didn't hit, it looked completely beatable to just, to just kind of an, an alarming rate for testing. And that is... GA Vader decks. <clears throat> so for those that don't know, GA Vader, he's the one that has the objective that says when you start conflict, the other player has to place a token on one of their non-vehicle units. Since most light side decks are character based, there's very few vehicle decks, that affects just about every single type of deck. Now, um, what I noticed is there was, it, it was a very um, volatile deck. So there was the good version of the deck, which is unbeatable, and then the bad version of the deck, which almost anyone can handle. So the good version looks like this. Turn one, you play some guys. Their turn one, they play one guy. That guy gets tapped down. Then um, you uh, turn two, play Vader. Vader goes and kills that guy. Their turn two, they play another guy. That guy gets tapped down. Your turn three, you play more guys, send Vader to kill the next guy. They just kept doing it. And you keep that pattern going to the point where by the time they're able to play two guys and actually make an attack, you're you're just going to have the Visage at that point, right? You're either going to have the Visage or you're going to have the TK Strike and you're going to negate another turn that they have. And then guess what? Turn four, you play more guys, send Vader again, and just keep killing their board. So they'll never be able to stabilize, and by the time they do, the game will likely be over, or they'll have like an objective killed with two objectives that have three damage on it, and the dial's at like eight or something. It, it just it looked completely unbeatable, particularly if somebody did not flop May the Force with you. If you have May the Force with you out of the gate, you have some chance because you, yeah, your guy gets tapped, but then he gets unfocused during refresh. So if your guy has a tactics, like maybe you played Yoda or. Um, I'm trying to think what other one. Maybe you play Dodonna or something. You know, you can foreseeably protect yourself for a turn. But then at that point, if they have a TK strike turn one or they have a Visage or they just beat you an edge, then your guy dies and you, you just start the cycle again. So 
I, I thought that that deck, like that version of the deck, looked so overwhelmingly powerful that it was just unfair. But then on the other hand, so that, that's, that's the good version of that deck. Then there's the bad version of that deck. The bad version of that deck is um, Dark Side's turn one, they play whatever. Light Side's turn one, they play stuff plus a nudge. And then they just keep that nudge in play and every single turn they tap down the nudge, rendering the objective irrelevant. And then more importantly, the problem with GA Vader decks is that people who play GA Vader, they tend to also play GA Palpatine. So that means you're not playing Core Vader, and you're playing at most one Palpatine, which means you don't got any Force Chokes. So you can't take out the nudges, and you don't have Force Lightning, or you maybe only have one, and you have removal, but your removal is way more conditional, right? Like you need to either win a Force Struggle by three to take him out of Palp's objective, or you need Vader to swing in on like a more or less open board. Um, and then a lot of people would also tend to play Janus with the deck. So Janus is nice, right? Like he's his event's really good, but it doesn't kill anything. So like once Light Side builds up a board, if Light Side all of a sudden has like four or five guys on the table, tapping down one dude with an event's not doing much. And then um, and if Vader's so like if Vader's reaction is getting soaked up by a nudge and they swing in with like four or five guys, your your tricks just don't matter. And the decks tend to have ways of just not having good edge hands because of the way they deploy their cards that I really, really didn't like what happens with the deck when Light Side can actually build a board. Um, and the, the way that Light Side builds a board is just do they have a nudge? If they have a nudge turn one, you're probably losing. And if they don't have a nudge turn one, you're probably winning. So uh, my problem that I had with that deck was I didn't like how much a turn one nudge swings that match of it. Like, a nudge should never be that powerful. Like, your deck should never, like, hinge on whether or not they draw a zero-cost unit their first turn. That seems kind of ridiculous to me that a deck would rely on that. So, when I was building a deck to figure out how to make this deck work, my thought was, okay, I need to deal with these nudges. That They have to go. So, I fired GA Palpatine, and I put in Core Palpatine, and then I thought, I still want more ways to get rid of nudges, so I added in one Art and Lin. Um, I also noticed that the difference between the deck having a turn two Vader and not having a turn two Vader is drastic. Like the, the, the turn two Vader versions of the deck, again, look completely unstoppable. And the ones that don't have the turn two Vader, they look eminently beatable. So my thinking was, I just want more targeted strike. Like I, I want to be able to get the targeted st strike train rolling so I thought, okay, I'm going to go two Vaders, two Maros, two Palpatines, and one Ardenland. And let's start there and, and figure out where we go. Uh, I did run into a problem where Maro only has two guns. So I wanted to get it a little bit more guns. I mean, you have the chokes, you have the given of your angers, but just another lightsaber would be nice. So I had to choose between Bach and um, Inquisitor. And I ultimately chose Inquisitor just because he's a better unit. And uh, the situational cards in the Inquisitor, I feel like I can use a little bit better than the situational cards that come with Bach. So I ultimately chose that route, plus I like card draw, plus Inquisitor has a better way of getting Arden Land in for free than, than Bach does. It, it just, it made more sense as, as a pod to put in. So now I'm at eight pods, and then for the last two pods, I wanted to deal with Spark, so I threw Tarkin in there. It was between Tarkin and Jarek, and I, I chose Tarkin. And then for the, the very last spot, I chose Ceres. Now, people that know me know that I know the truth and that Ceres is trash. But I have enough toolbox stuff in there that having the resource and having the extra kill spell, that was enough to justify putting in crap units like Ceres and her chub. And throughout the tournament, the, those two really didn't ever show up. Plus also Ceres can still trigger Vader's um, fate card and you can use TK Strike on herself to tap down Luke. So it's not like she's a complete dumpster fire of a unit, but she's pretty close to that. So you try never to play her if you don't have to, and that's why she's a one-off. Um, so that was a deck I, I, I built, and it took me a couple tries to kind of figure where I wanted to be with it. But it played a whole lot better because I could just get more cheap wins, right? Because sometimes I would play an opponent, I noticed with this deck, where their turn one is guy plus nudge and then I just kill the nudge. So then the nudge is dead. Now their guy gets tapped. Maybe they take the force and make the force. Maybe they don't. 
but now I'm in the driver's seat, right? I have negated their first turn. I can start, and if I have like a Mara turn one or a Vader turn two, I can start targeted striking or at least threaten to targeted strike, which forces them to actually play an edge battle. So maybe if they were saving a unit for their next turn, now they might have to use that unit right now in edge to prevent their guy from dying, which means they're more likely to draw a shit hand next turn. And again, just giving me these cheap wins. So I was able to get a decent number of games where it's like, yeah, you get the targeted strike train rolling, you get Mar and Vader out there, and as they play guys, you just go in there and kill them, and then uh, next thing you know, you've popped three objectives and the game's over. So I, I liked what that deck could do just on the cheap win side of it. And then also, the other thing too is, like I said earlier, Vader's abilities to tap down guys, namely through his fake card and through his event card, are much much more valuable if your if your opponent only has one or two guys available to attack if they have three or four those lose a ton of value but if they have like one guy and that guy's going to go put in work and you stop that guy and you don't even have to win edge you just you play the fake card and they don't twist it or you play the zk strike and get them out of the way giving yourself more time to do that makes it so now you can target a strike on the back swing and take them out or just buy time on the dial right like like there's it was a good way to make sure i can get these cheap wins i could have still played navy right navy can still get you the cheap wins but i felt personally like this was the best way to be oppressive and get these cheap wins while still being able to have enough tricks to be able to beat my opponents if they draw well because that, that's what i don't like about navy i feel like navy you can largely pick them apart and playing as navy as, as a player it's less about what can i do to win the game and more about can i just draw not terrible cards and hopefully they don't draw well enough to beat me so i, I felt like with sith I, i'm more in control of my own destiny and see how it goes from there now on light side i wanted cheap ones too and i was thinking really hard about playing vehicles uh just because i thought there's people more people are running split factions than they probably should. I know I was running split factions. And I know that Sith just cannot deal with vehicles. So I was thinking, like, if I just run Rebel Capital ships, I'm going to win one third of my games just almost automatically. So then all I have to really do is just play Navy and Scum kind of do a push, and, and I should be fine. But the problem is I don't have enough experience with vehicles. I, I can't play fighters because I know people are going to be playing Tarkin. So I have to play capital ships, and capital ships just feel too fluky to me that I didn't have the balls to play. Now, I mean, on the other hand, you have uh, Colby from the New York meta. He had the nuts to run speeders and did really well with them. So it's not like uh, it's not like nobody had the balls to run it, but I personally just didn't quite have the balls to run it. But um, my, my deck that I did run was a Kraken deck, and the reason I ran it, outside of it just being one of my favorite decks, is that... Darkseid has so many different options that my thinking was, I don't know, like well, while my deck can handle all of them, and all of my decks I built them to handle the three factions, I didn't know which um, faction in particular was going to be the dominant faction. I was suspecting Navy was going to be the number one just because I think when the chips are down, people are going to play the safe stuff. So I thought Navy might be the dominant one, but I wasn't sure. So I thought, okay, well, the deck that's the most versatile deck that I have is that deck. So I'll run it, and I'll bank on Undercover getting me back the key cards. So in the games I played against Navy, like there was one game in particular where all I needed was Twist of Fate. Because the thing about Navy is their edge hands are actually pretty bad. So if you can pick up enough Twist to cancel out their um, Imperial Fist, and to just make them lose cards. It's really easy to predict exactly how many pips it's gonna to take to beat them at edge, and you can always ensure that you strike first if you really, really want to. I mean, you can always shut off Mousetroids too. You can either lock them down or just play Chuds or something, so. And there, there's a very simple way to beat them. Um, it's not easy, right? Like, it, it, while it's simple in how to beat Navy, it's not easy to beat Navy, if that makes sense, right? Like, I can tell you how to beat Mike Tyson in a fight, but if you're not fast enough to beat them, you're just not going to beat them. You can know what to do and still lose. So um, against against Navy, I'm thinking, okay, I know what I need if I want to beat them. I don't know how many of them I'm going to I'm going to be up against, but 
I'll, I'll just bank on undercover. And, and it worked, right? Like, I, I was able to twist a guy like three or four times in a game with only two twists in my deck. But I just kept shuffling it in because twist in that matchup, twist and um, secret objective become your two most important cards in the deck. So just being able to shuffle them back in and making sure you can always trigger them when you need to, uh, that was pretty useful. And then um, against Scum, Bamboozle becomes your number one card, so that becomes like an auto shuffle every time. It's just like, I felt like the versatility of the deck allowed itself to, to play well against all the matchups, but then one of the other things was that deck and um, Owen, Owen Luke decks, those are the two decks that can capitalize on slow dark side starts better than any other deck. So an example of a cheap win that I got with my light side deck was I was playing against uh, Josh Johnston in the top cut. So we were both in loser's bracket. I go light side, he goes dark side. And um, his turn one was terrible. He played the resource, like like the creature resource that draws you card when you play creatures. And he played a protector, like Palpatine's protector, and passed. The moment he does that, it's like, okay, if my deck has enough firepower to steamroll him, I win the game, and if my deck's a slow deck, he can come back, right? But my deck was a faster deck, so my turn one, I go Nudge plus Lando's Chud plus Lando himself, the undercover brother version of him, and um, just steamroll, right? Nudge goes in, seeds, locks out his guy. Little dude goes in, puts two damage on one objective. Lando goes in, puts three damage on another objective. Locks down his dude. His next turn, he, he's hosed, right? Because there's already six damage across his objectives. And his guy's tapped down. So he's going to have five resources to play stuff. But it's unlikely that there's five resources of anything in his deck that's going to protect him from the onslaught that's coming next turn. Because I played a resource turn one. So that means my turn two, I can play Yoda, I can play Kraken, I can play a Falcon, I can play Hired Hands plus some other stuff. There's a lot of ways that my deck goes off next turn and possibly just wins the game. And there's not a whole lot of ways he can defend. Now his next hand, he had a decent enough hand. He played an Energy Spider and he played a Torrent Attack. So he got two blockers on the table and he got to draw two cards. So he should be able to win edge and he should be able to block two attacks. My next turn, I play to save a friend, so I get a fourth attack, so I can weed out his defenders, and I play Falcon, and and it was just over right there, right? Like he got off to too slow of a start. My deck has enough blast to punish him. I have enough distinct attackers to punish him, and I could just send dudes in in an order in which, like when I sent Falcon in to block to attack, to potentially blow up an objective, he had to block with a Torrent attack, and he had to try to win edge. Now, I ultimately conceded Edge because I knew I wasn't going to win anyways, but I just bounced the Falcon, played another dude, um, I think it was Yoda, and just kept piling on the pressure, and he didn't really have any hope to win that game, and what it really came down to was he had a crap opening hand, and my deck was able to punish him. But let's say my deck were a little bit slower. He plays Protector plus Resource, and let's say I play, I don't know, like let's say I just play Yoda, right? I play Yoda, I swing in, deal two damage, take force. Then he plays Torrent Attack plus Spider. And then let's say my turn two is I play, I don't know, Luke or something, right? Like let's say I'm playing a standard Jedi deck. I play either Luke or I play Luke's Land Speeder or I play Qron or um, I play Trissaw or some other standard unit that, um, that Light Side has for Jedi. Now I can't attack because he has se uh, six cards in hand I have at best five cards in hand. He has an edge advantage, and um, if you try to swing into a Torrent attack, Torrent attack's gonna block. He's gonna be able to um, to kill whatever you throw at him. You can't shield the damage. You can't protect the damage. So now you're playing the Force game. Now I could still, you know, I could play Luke and I can commit Luke and I can, you know, play the slow game. But I'm giving him time, right? Like he would now have three units on the board and they're not and they're no longer locked down he could maybe draw an debater he could maybe play resources and then play more chuds and you give your opponent the opportunity to come back from a terrible start um my deck doesn't allow that like if if my deck sees that you have a crap start i can roll out the chuds like i can come out with a turn one where i go yoda you seek yoda plus higher hands plus lando's chud and I have three 
distinct sources of blasts on the table, you're not stopping all three. You stop one and get, you know, hit by the other two. So having that in, in the deck, just cheap wins. I think another example of a deck that can do that is the um, the Rebel Commandos. In the Rebel Commandos, if you get off to a slow start, like, you know, one unit with no tactics, and I come out with two of Han's Chuds and, like, I don't know, one of Judder's guys or something, and I start swinging your hose because, like, I'll send one one of Han's Chuds, you probably block and kill it. I send the other one that's putting three damage on an objective, and then I send Judder's guy, and he's putting two damage on another one, and then I'm going to come around the other side and just keep putting more and more pressure. And if you can't stop my initial burst of attack, you're probably just done for. So, um, when I played against him, that, that was a cheap one. That, that's a very cheap light side win. But you need the deck to be able to do that. Like So I, I made a conscious effort with both of my decks to make sure that I can get these cheap wins. Because my thinking is, it's going to take a lot of wins to get there. Some wins, like for example, when I played uh, John Hurth Clark in Swiss, those were two very hot, far, hard fought wins. I swept him, but I very easily could have been swept, because his decks are really good, and he's a really good player, and he actually drew fairly well in both of those games, particularly against Scum. It's like, I, I played against his Scum deck, and he comes out with turn one duel, turn one spider, and a turn one Malakili, and then he comes out turn two with Ponda Baba, a spider, and a Galactic Scum. Like, that. that's generally a situation where you're probably losing. The only reason I won that game was... I got an early bamboozle, and I bamboozled him, and then I used undercover, and I shuffled the bamboozle back in, and then I was able to bamboozle the next turn, and I think I bamboozled him one more time that game um, to just keep his board locked down, because he had enough firepower to just go and wipe clean all my objectives and then start dual moving tokens and stuff. Um, so it was that, and also the fact that he had the hunters out, which made it so I was able to blow up his three objectives at the same time, so that was pretty fortuitous for me but um yeah i mean i probably i probably should have lost that game i think against a lot of opponents he, I, they probably lose there because he had a really good draw i just happen to also have a good draw and my deck performed slightly better than his deck but i could i could have lost that game it, it was very very close and then um against his light side deck he was rolling out a brainiac deck he got early brainiac he got the astromex um but he messed up a trigger on pulling off of his resource so he went into turn two so his turn two he had luke and a lightsaber but instead of having five resources available he only had three resources available and that small mistake gave me another cheap win because i was able to start picking off his board by the time he was able to get luke out there i had more or less taken over the game and uh and that was all it took so so sometimes you just need that like like you need to get these cheap wins in order to win these tournaments and I think some people, they, they build decks that are all about upside. They're all about playing against good players. And that's like one of the few problems of playing against too many good players is that if you play against too many players that are good and don't make mistakes and play top tier decks, you're not going to get to see whether or not your deck can just cruise through the, the weaker players, right? You're not going to get to see what happens when you play against a good player and they mess up. Because I know when I play, um, when I play at home, um, what we do is, is we'll say, okay, well, if you miss a trigger, you just get the trigger, right? So, like, you know, if you miss a resource trigger, you get it back. Because we want to see what does the deck do against the best possible draws. But sometimes people don't do get the best possible draws. Sometimes people miss triggers. Sometimes uh, you're, you're going to be given chances to win games you probably shouldn't win. And some decks do a much, much better job at capitalizing on that than other decks do. Um... So, yeah, that, that's that's all I really wanted to talk about. I just want to talk about cheap wins. And so, like, I know regional season... It's weird to think that regional season is actually starting up right now. It's it's November. But um, I know there's a big tournament happening somewhere in, like, Ohio or something. And, you know, if if I were going to that tournament, right, or if, if I'm going to a tournament in December, I'm going to a tournament in January, what I'm doing in, in these tournaments is um, I'm going to pick whatever deck can just for sure beat the lowest common denominator, right? Like, what deck, if my opponent draws poorly, just wins? And then from there, you move forward, right? Like, from there, you say, okay, let's get that baseline wins, and then 
start testing for decks that work on top of that. So like, that's why I didn't want to play capital ships. Capital ships, at their best, beat everything. At their worst, lose to everything. And, and I don't want to play that. But if you if you want to play like Owen, Luke, Yoda, those decks at their best beat everything, but also at their worst still beat a lot of stuff, right? Like if you get off to a slow start, you're probably going to get murdered by unfinished business and a lightsaber and you know all, all sorts of other shenanigans those decks have. Um, anyway, so that's all I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, it's been holding all the cards. Hope you enjoyed it.